All right, Frank Hardy, you were, uh, you were born in Pitt County, North Carolina, is that right? Yes. My name is Frank Hardy, Jr. I was born August 26, 1929, in Pitt County, North Carolina, seven miles out of Greenville, North Carolina, on a tobacco farm. I was raised on a tobacco farm, and we raised tobacco, cotton, corn, and peanuts. I registered for the military September 19. 48, after I turned 18, and in January 1950, I received a letter to report to my draft board in September because farmers got a delay in being drafted. So I went on up to the draft board in uh, late January or February. They took me right on in because I wanted to be a paratrooper, and you. You did not get drafted into the paratroopers. You had to volunteer to become a paratrooper. And uh, there's, they sent me on up to Raleigh a week or so later, and I was inducted into the military March the 18th, 1950. From there directly into Fort Jackson, South Carolina, where I took my first eight weeks of infantry basic. Then after that, straight to Fort Bend in Georgia to take my jump training. And after Fort Bend and jump training, I went to Fort Polk, Louisiana for my ranger training. And after that, with a three-day delay directly to Korea, where I was assigned to the 5th Airborne Division. But I, I was attached to the 378 Combat Engineers because the filth at that time was all was not segregated. They were, got segregated later when they came back stateside. And uh, I was assigned to the 378 Combat Engineer Div uh, Company, the 36th Engineer Group, where I acted as a recon, me and uh, a platoon of us paratroopers. See, see, the 378 was a, a leg outfit. That means they were non-jumpers. We were assigned to them as jumpers and reconnaissance. And when they got ready to go on the mountaintop to dig in uh, an infantry outfit or to put in gun emplacements or anything, we jumped in and reconned it, did a reconnaissance on it to clear it. And we were jumping on this day in 1950. Two and into a hornet's nest, a platoon of us, 48. Out of the 48 that jumped, only 13 of us got back. The rest of them were killed on the way down, shot. And I was hit in the side of the knee. I couldn't run. I ordered the men to get the hell over the mountain, pardon my French. Uh, and I laid down with my BAR man, which was nearby. I got his BAR, Browning Automatic Rifle, and his ammo. I laid down behind a rock, and I held North Koreans back while my men got over the mountaintop in the rear. And I ran out of ammunition, and they come up on me and captured me. Why do I have shot? God had to be in my corner. But because if I had a man in my outfit, I'd come up on after killing as many men. Now it was a confirmed kill of 127 North Korean soldiers that I killed. They just captured me. I stood up and saluted them when they got to me. I stood up and then I fell. And this lieutenant, Lieutenant Dormany, I think was his name, reported me as killed. So that's the way it went down. And then. My mother and father, I was actually captured. I was on the death march in Korea. We never slept in the barracks, never slept in the stockade. And uh, my mother and daddy were called to D.C. by, well, received the letters from D.C. to go to D.C. and meet with President Truman, where they were awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor in my honor, and so forth, and, and given my $20,000 uh, GI insurance being dead, because I made them my sole beneficiary. But get back to when, while I was a prisoner, 
We walked, and I got to know one of the guards, Kim uh, Chung Lee was his name. He was educated in Chicago, came home to visit his parents, and got drafted right into the North Korean Army. We talked about every day. He next to me, he walked next to me, and I was between two other prisoners for their help to get along good. And one evening I had worked something out, because I figured this is going to be my last day on earth. Cause, now the reason it was called a death march is because at the end of each day, we slept on the ground, and those that couldn't keep up, this lieutenant in charge of the POWs, shot your, shot your butt and rolled you in the hole and covered you up. The hole was already dug. That's why it was called a death march. I just figured that the day was going to be my last day because I wasn't keeping up that good. It took two other POWs to keep me up and going good. And so I spoke to Chung Lee. I asked him, but there was one more guard between where I was at in the column and the rear of the column. I asked Chung Lee, could he get that guard's attention across the mountain, and look at the mountain. He said, what you gonna do? He said, no, don't tell me. And uh, he did, he eased on back, he worked his cell phone back to him and got him looking at something across the valley, up the hill there somewhere, and I laid down the bushes, which was about four foot high, and they walked right on by me. I got up, found me an old limb for a crutch, and got that North Star to my back, and I headed south. I topped the mountain, and looked way down here in the valley, I seen a light. Well, I decided I'd try and see who was around there. And all I got, I, I crawled down closer, got close to him, and all I ever saw in that old shack was an old mama son and an old papa son. That's an old, that's the way they call the old folks in Korea. So I decided to make myself known because my knee was starting to pain me pretty bad. And uh, I crawled down and they took me in, doctored my knee, gave me some medication for pain, and uh, got me back to my lines. And this was the latter part of 52. They got me to one of my outfits and they took me back to Seoul, to, a rep, to the Repa Depot and get me ready to ship. And this is something else that <laughs> I took off from the Repa Depot there in Seoul and rejoined my outfit. Cause I, and we were sitting for me to jump because I knew the area that they walked about every day. I wanted to kill that lieutenant. They caught up with me and carried, carried me back to Seoul and shipped me home. My dad was dying when I got home. He lived 12 days. He hung on for me. He knew I wasn't dead. We buried him and then I reported back to Fort Bragg. And the provost marshal called me in as soon as I joined and was assigned to an outfit. I wanted to know how I was going to, he said, how you want to pay this back? I said, pay what back? He said, uh, at $20,000 insurance. I said, buddy, let me tell you, the military is not going to tell me I got to pay it back we will go to a civilian court. What do you mean? I said, because you got nobody, you didn't have my dog tags, all you had was a report that I was killed. You never got a body. I said, here stands the body. I said, so you're not gonna tell me I got to pay it back. So I, I went, joined my outfit, which was a training outfit then in Fort Bragg. I became a field first sergeant, uh, training recruits their first eight weeks. I received a new policy in my paperwork and never heard anything else about paying that $20,000 back. 1960, I went to Germany. I got to know General Gavin and told him I wanted to go to take a tour in Germany. So in the latter part of 53, I went to Germany. He got me on uh, and joined. I was assigned to the 10th Special Forces in Batoch, Germany where I became a, a special force man too. And put three years there and then came back to Fort Bragg and 
rejoined the training outfit. Now, from there, I was discharged. I bet your dad was glad to see you. Oh, my there. God, yes. Yes, uh, he, he had cancer all over his body. He, he dealt with, uh, he used to build boxcars for the train company and uh, for air conditioning, and they used this asbestos insulation, and that got to him and killed him. He, in 1940s, he worked winters at the roundhouse, it was called, building these boxcars, and he worked in the asbestos, and everything back there then, the houses, everything, it, the insulation was asbestos, and that gave my old cancer. My dad had cancer all over his body. But he, I tell you, he came home for one day after I got home, and then we had to carry him up to uh, Moorhead City, North Carolina, to the hospital there before he died. But he just stood up and came home one day while, when I, after I got home. He was so happy to see me. He hung on to see me, because he told him, you might as well keep the money and everything. He said, because my son's not dead. And I wasn't. <laughs> as we all know. As far as any veterans benefits, have you been able to? I have any? never asked Uncle Sam for one red penny. I've never asked Uncle Sam's help in anything. Now the last two years, I was contacted, my buddy over here who used to be, live across the street down this street in front of the driveway. He got someone in D.C. to look it up, trying to get me some benefits. They were unse unsuccessful. And then I had a friend that came by camp every time I had a yard sale. I have little yard sales out here to help take up a little of the expense slack. He came by and he said, my dad's been working on it for four years trying to get help. Had been, and said he just died last month, month before last, something like that. He said they were waiting for him to die, and that's what I figured they've been doing with me the last two years. Been trying, but that's the only help I've ever asked them for. I, I don't. I've never been to the military hospital for anything, or a doctor. I bought extra insurance to handle uh, myself going to the doctor. I feel they owe me something. But I've never felt good asking the military for doing something that I, I call my duty. I love my country, I, I, and I'd do the same thing all over again if I had to, if I could. And I'm a little, a little out of shape now to even think about it. But uh, I volunteered to go in to start with. I asked for what I got. I volunteered for each move, and from going to take my jump train. Of course, when I enlisted, I enlisted for the paratroopers, but you had to take at eight weeks of, of uh, infantry training. So I was assigned to Fort Jackson Tank Hill for that. But then they sent me to, but now the ranger, they sent me to Fort Benning. Now my ranger training, I had, I had asked for that while I was in, uh, my jump training, and I got that, and then I asked for Korea after my ranger training. So I volunteered for all of it along the way. I see that picture here. Can you tell us a little bit about that? That picture was taken just outside of Seoul in what we call a tent city, a rest area, rear area, 1952, it was June or July. I was 21 here. August would have been my 22nd birthday. And the skull and crossbone, as everybody that's been a ranger in combat, knows that we had a little patch with skull and crossbone on it. I found this, skull, this skeleton up in the mountains and brought it down and made me one realistically. And uh, graves registration took it away from me. I won't let you bring that back, huh? <laughs> no. <laughs> Off in that body, I got a 38 pistol wrapped in consoline wrapping and a American pocket watch. 
in his pockets. Won't nothing but skeleton there. But you found skeletons everywhere, all around the, anywhere you went, and you, you'd find skeletons of North Koreans. They, they didn't police up their dead. They'd walk over the dead, like when I shot that 127, that was all one shoot. They just run over the dead bodies and, and, and slow down. It's, I, I, that's something I'm not proud of, but I had to do it for my men. And they got away. But yeah, this is when I was, I was 21 in that picture. August, I would have been 22. This was taken in our rear area, just outside of Seoul, Korea. And that's all you have left. Where, yeah. Do you have any of your memorabilia or anything? Everything, my discharges, my, uh, any papers from the military went to my mom, my home address. And my mom died, now I'm trying to find out who got her cedar chest, because she kept everything in a cedar chest. And I'll find them and get everything together directly. But I, I sent her, I, I got the discharge on my re-ups, and I mailed them to her. And uh, I sent her a picture when I captured a, a Korean prisoner, had my gun on him, and that's in her stuff. A lot of other stuff that I sent to my mom to put away for me. I'm surprised that I remember so much. <laughs> I am getting old in years, you know. I'm 88 now. I still love my life. I'm still proud that I went there and served and did what I did. You know, this medal, I never exercised the knowledge of having that until, well, my buddy found out. President Obama wanted me to come to the White House and have it re-given to me in my name. And I just didn't like the man. I'm sorry. I had no respect for him, so I didn't go. And this CIA agent came to my house uh, posing as General Gavin. It didn't dawn on me that General Gavin, the last time I saw him, which was back in 54, 55, he was already 50-some years old. He'd had been over 100 years old now. I told him, no, I am not going. He tried to tell me to go, and I said, no, I'm not going. He said, well, you may have to suffer some consequences. I said, well, shoot him at me. He wiped my record clean somehow on the computer. He couldn't get nothing on it. My, do my daughter said, Dad, I can't get nothing. And then he, he called me and said, how you like the consequences? They found him dead over in Woodbridge, Virginia with a bullet hole between the eyes hmm. in a motel room. And a one-way ticket to Russia. This guy that was, uh, Bill had for me in D.C., he tried to clean up the record. But he said, he's got something, I don't know. I don't know how much he got there because I, I don't have a computer and I don't get on a computer. I can't see how to do nothing with it. But my military life, I loved. I had intentions of, oh, this is something, another part of it. I had all intentions of staying in and retiring. About 21 days before my discharge, 1960, a regimental clerk called me and said, Son Hardy, I got some good news and some bad news for you. I said, well, go ahead and lay the bad news on me. He said, you're going to Cambodia. I said, what on earth for? I said, well, they're going to start up in Vietnam. You know, Vietnam wasn't going on then. And uh, the Rangers and Special Forces are going to spearhead. I said, uh, what about you going to ship me out with 21 days left on my d before discharge? You're not going to re-up? I said, heavens no, not now. <laughs> and I didn't. <laughs> my buddy went, one of my buddies went, he said, sorry, Hardy, this is going to be a piece of cake. 30 days after it started up, he's back home in a body bag. And that is what I was afraid would happen to me. I, had, I didn't have the faith that I could go back to uh, another war and come home. I never had any doubts in Korea. I knew, always knew I'd come home. But I did not believe I could go to another war and come back alive. 
So that's the reason I didn't re-up and stay in for retirement. So here I am. I did, though. I truly loved the military. I loved I was a top-notch soldier. Of course, in 22 months in service, I was a sergeant. And I had buddies that spent 15 years in and still was on a corporal, E3. And uh, I was a sergeant first class by 1953. When I came back from 1953 and reassigned in Fort Bragg, North Carolina, I was a sergeant. But uh, I, I took over a basic training outfit, first eight weeks, as a field first sergeant and made sergeant first class, the E7, right away. I was a good soldier. I was a top notch soldier because I loved what I was doing. You want to see where you. Where your scar from your surgery? Oh, I got one over here, and I got a knee brace on my other one. See, just straight down the middle, where they went in there and worked on that one. And the other one is the same. I'm getting this knee brace off. The other one is the same as that one. Getting that knee brace off and getting it back on is a problem. Yeah. Gary Lay is a dear, dear friend, and he's my lawyer. <laughs> We couldn't have made it without him due to things that had happened to us through debit cards got stolen. With the help of my dear, dear friend, we'll get out of it. Thank you, Gary. It's my pleasure, Frank. Thank you. Because my eyesight went on me. I'm diabetic, and my eyesight's diabetic, what they call a diabetic fade. I'm legally blind. I can see where I'm going, but it's like I'm looking through a fog. Went and had my eyes examined in 2015. They wouldn't give me no glasses. They didn't have no prescription for that because I was legally blind. So I gave up my driver's license. They had me down to drive at 45 mile an hour only. I could get a ticket for driving 50. Mm. So the wife became my sole chauffeur. Like I said earlier, in the summertime, weather permitting, I try to have little yard sales out here every weekend, Friday and Saturday. And that helps out with the, my cash balance. And I do pretty good at it. When people donate to me the stuff to buy, and I get furniture, I get, uh, got a couple of Dishwashers last year were donated to me. A refrigerator. I got a freezer. I sell anything. I had a couple of bikes <laughs> and a four wheeler. That's about it. That's the life of old Frank Hardy Jr. I'm real proud of what I did. It was an honor for me to go over there and fight for my country. And. We, we may have to get right back in with North Korea, and that's going to be a terrible war if we do, because that nut, that, that son that took over after dad, his dad, he's more fanatic, fanatical than his dad was. And he's dealing in nuclear. And that's good. If I was president and nothing else would do, I'd drop my nuclear bomb right on where I figured, and they know where his nuclear plant is, I'm sure. They've got spies over there. Drop it on there and wipe it completely off. Dead hit him right away. That's the only way he's going to get him out. I think of the other wars we've had. and Korea was one of the worst. But I still, I never resent it going over there. I volunteered to go there. I volunteered for what I got. I asked for it. Like, I'm not sorry a little bit. And I've met a lot of good people. Now, and whoever stole my debit card number and have used it for two months now and put me in a terrible jam. Now, that's what I hate is that I felt and willing to give my life up for somebody like that. I can't stand a thief humiliating. That's the reason I've had to ask for help 
the last two months. And again, I've got a lot of pride. I hate asking for help, but I got a dear friend like you, Gary. You act like you enjoy doing it, and I thank you for that. I do. I get a little emotional. <laughs> I'm sorry. But I'm proud I served. I love my country. And look outside of my door and you'll see that I love my flag. Worth dying for, in my book. So again, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See, I got my Ranger flag up there, and I got my Special Forces flag, and my Army f flag is hanging on the other end of the porch. We were eating oatmeal and grits when I met Gary. I met you. And Gary Lee came along. I think the lady that we knew good well with DSS sent you to us. Yeah, I had asked her, because <clears throat> we were having a food distribution surplus right. at, the, uh, at the Cleveland Mission where, where I volunteer, right. and I ha happened to ask her, I said, do you know anybody that needs food? Uh, we have a surplus, and she said, well, I just got off the phone with a lady, that, a friend of mine who, who said that they needed some food. And so I came over and met you guys and really enjoyed talking with you. My life changed then, I, for the better. He really brought us out of a jam. And again, Gary Lee, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome, Frank. It's my pleasure. Well, I guess that's about it. I can't think of anything else. It's a wrap. A wrap.